the National Science Board's virtual media briefing on the release of 2020 Science and Engineering Indicators. I'm the Dean Lynn, Communications Director for the National Science Board. You should all have received a copy of our press release, but if you did not, please let us know and we will email you a copy. Our briefing today will run from 10 to 11 a.m. During the first 45 minutes, Dr. Diane Suvain, Chair of the National Science Board, Dr. Arthur Lupia, NSF Assistant Director for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences, and Dr. Julia Phillips, Chair of the National Science Board Science and Engineering Policy Committee, will present. At around 10.45 a.m., we will invite questions. I will let you know how to do that when we get to the Q&A portion of the briefing. Please note that if you've joined via the listen-only option, you will not be able to see the presentation or to ask questions. We will end the briefing promptly at 11 a.m. Let me now turn to Dr. Suvain to start off the presentation. Thank you, Nadine. Welcome, everyone. I'm Diane Suvain, Chair of the National Science Board. We're delighted to be here to brief you on the Science and Engineering Indicators 2020, the congressionally mandated report on the state of U.S. science. This report is nearly two years in the making and is thanks to the hard work of NSF's National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, or NCSES. I would especially like to acknowledge the tireless efforts of the Indicator's authors, of the Tikath Khan, Program Director for Indicators, of Emilda Rivers, Head of NCSES, and Skip Lupia, NSF's Assistant Director for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. And I want to acknowledge the amazing leadership and dedication of my board colleague, Julia Phillips. Julia is the chair of the National Science Board Committee that oversees the production of this report which was especially exciting and a demanding role in this particular cycle, as you'll hear about shortly. The National Science Board, which was founded in 1950 as part of the NSF Act, has two roles. It serves as a policy-making board for NSF and as a body of advisors to the White House and Congress on national policy issues related to science and engineering and to STEM education. In its NSF-focused role, the board and the NSF director jointly pursue the goals and the functions of the foundation. Board members identify issues critical to NSF's future and work with the director to establish agency policies. The director oversees NSF staff and day-to-day -day management. As advisor to the administration and Congress, the board issues reports and statements thanks broadly about the changing landscape of the s &E enterprise and NSF's role within it and works towards developing a long-term vision for science and engineering in the United States. Indicators is used by a wide variety of people, including policymakers, researchers, and members of the media. Over time, the report has transformed from a 150-page paper report in 1972 to a main report that, if printed, would be nearly 2,000 pages long, while providing a treasure trove of high-quality information that does not exactly make it easily digestible, even with the transition to an all-digital format. Above, you can see a screenshot of the new website for indicators, which will go live tomorrow. This cycle, we have further reimagined indicators, which you'll hear more about in a moment. However, the main report still covers the wide range of topics to which you are all accustomed, education, workforce, R&D, academic R&D, publications, production and trade, innovation, public attitudes and understanding of science, and state level data. Key data on all these topics are summarized in the new printed report, The State of U.S. Science and Engineering. At the NSB, we have also developed a variety of products to make the information even more accessible to our stakeholders. Some of these products are policy neutral. However, the board also produces companion pieces to indicators to draw attention to trends that are interesting, concerning, or otherwise have policy implications. Drawing on indicators data, we have covered topics such as the career pathways of STEM PhDs, the need to diversify our STEM-capable workforce, and most recently, a report on the skilled technical workforce. With Indicators 2020, we're releasing an updated state set of state one-pagers which we introduced for the first time in 2018. A state's S&E performance helps fuel its and the nation's economy. Four benchmarks at each state's S&E performance are highlighted in these one-pagers. The cost of higher pub a public higher education, the size of the STEM workforce, investment in research and development, and venture capital funding. 
each state's performance on these measures is compared to the U.S. average or median so that you can see how your state stacks up. There are copies of each state's one pager on the sign-in table and you can also download them from the NS at NSB's website. Now I'd like to turn to NSF's Assistant Director for Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences to introduce you to the reimagined indicators. Thank you, Lapia. Thank you, Dr. Sedain. On behalf of the National Science Foundation, thank you for joining us today. Through NSF's distinctive approach to funding basic science and its partnerships with innovative stakeholders, researchers across the country are producing science that's changing the world. NSF's Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate, where I work, supports research on vital topics that enhance national security and provide new opportunities for American workers. This part of NSF is also the home of the NCSES, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. The NCSES is one of 13 principal federal statistical agencies. Under the steady guidance of the National Science Board, the NCSES produces the science and engineering indicators. The NCSES also produces many other statistics and reports and is widely regarded as the world's premier source for information on the science and engineering enterprise. The National Science Board and the NCSES have worked hard on this version of the science and engineering indicators. They, this version of the indicators now releases important statistical information in ways that are more timely and more frequent than ever before. And NCSES has also built a new website that makes this information easier to find. Producing this report has been a team effort, and it is now my privilege to hand things off to our incredible team leader, Dr. Julia Phillips. Good morning. Since World War II, advancements in science and technology have driven 85% of our economic growth. They have underpinned our national security and transformed nearly every aspect of the daily lives of Americans. Our preeminence in science and engineering has not happened by chance. Sustained bipartisan commitment to investing in fundamental research has played a key and pivotal role in establishing and maintaining our knowledge ecosystem with academia, government, and the private sector partnering to drive innovation. As we think about what our country needs to compete in the new global ec economy, we must renew our commitment to strengthening our science and engineering enterprise. Collectively, we must do this because the world has changed and our country has changed. And while science is the endless frontier, we are not the only explorers. The data you are about to see illustrate this new global context. While future American preeminence is not assured, I think we should react with excitement, not fear, to this new world. We are well positioned to compete, collaborate, and thrive. Since 2000, global research and development investments have tripled, reflecting increased competition in knowledge-intensive industries and recognition of the crucial role that R&D plays in addressing global health, security, and environmental challenges. Indicators 2020 confirms a trend that the National Science Board has observed for several years. While the U.S. remains a leading player, other countries have seen the benefits of investing in research and education and are following our example. While China is not the only story, its dramatic annual rate of R&D growth um, other, um, is impressive. Other countries have seen the benefits of investing in research and um, China is on a path to shortly become the world's largest R&D performer. But there is more to the story and we must dig a little deeper into the different types of R&D. We also want to be clear and consistent as we talk about these different types of R&D. So let's quickly define the terminology that we are going to use. Basic research is experimental or theoretical work that is undertaken primarily to acquire new knowledge of the underlying foundations of phenomena and observable facts without any particular application or use in view. Applied research 
is original investigation undertaken in order to acquire new knowledge. It is, however, directed primarily towards a specific practical aim or objective. These two together form fundamental research, which I like to think of as being inquiry into how the world works. Experimental development is quite different. It is a systematic effort based on existing knowledge from research or practical experience directed toward creating novel or improved materials, products, devices, processes, systems, or services. And this is where innovation typically comes in. In 2017, the U.S. spent more on research and development than any other country, $548 billion. But now, let's break this out into fundamental and experimental development. As you can see, the U.S. continues to spend more on fundamental research than other countries, and by a large margin. This is significant because, together, basic and applied research are the seed corn of the U.S. science and engineering enterprise. They form the global competitive advantage and the starting point for much of our GDP growth since World War II. This is where the industries of the future are born. China, on the other hand, is spending heavily in experimental development and surpassed the U.S. in around 2013 in this area. It's worth noting that the majority of the rise in, of China's expenditures in research and development have been on the development side. And as I said earlier, this is where innovation typically occurs. If we look at the changes in global research and development expenditures since 2000, China has accounted for almost one-third of the total global growth. The world of research and development performance, historically centered around the United States, Western Europe, and Japan, has been shifting toward the East and Southeast Asia, particularly South Korea and India, in addition to China. Even with an average annual growth in R&D spending of 4.3 in the U.S., which is quite respectable, since the beginning of this century, our global share of research and development has declined from 37% to 25%. This is a story we see repeatedly in Indicators 2020, that while the U.S. science and engineering enterprise is growing in absolute terms, simultaneously, our share of the global science and engineering enterprise is decreasing. This is not necessarily good or bad, but it does suggest that our response should be very intentional. Knowledge and technology intensive industries contribute globally more than $9 trillion in output, accounting for 11% of the global gross domestic product. KTI industries are defined by their R&D intensity. The rate of an industry's intensive industries and um, the, the rate of, uh, the ratio of an industry's R&D expenditures to its value added output. They consist of five high intensive, high R&D intensive industries and eight medium high R&D intensive industries. The U.S. is the world's largest producer of output in high R&D intensive industries, accounting for nearly a third of global production. These industries are manufacturing of aircraft, pharmaceuticals, computer electronic and optical products, computer software publishing, and science, scientific R&D services. Between 2000 and 2018, the global output from high R&D intensive industries more than doubled exceeding $3 trillion in 2018. Over the same period, U.S. output increased 45%, quite impressive, from nearly $600 billion to $1 trillion. As a result, the U.S. global share decreased from 38% to 32%, decreased from 38% to 32%. Over the same period, the EU's and Japan's global shares also declined, while China starting from a low base, increased from 6% to 21%. So, how do we measure the production of new knowledge from R&D? One way, of course, is to look at the number of peer-reviewed publications, which continue to grow steadily. 
the EU, China, United States, India, Japan, and South Korea together produce more than 70% of the worldwide refereed science and engineering publications. The output of peer-reviewed S&E publications in recent years has grown more rapidly in middle-income countries than in high-income countries. China's S&E publication output has risen nearly tenfold since 2000, and as a result, China's output in terms of absolute quantity now exceeds that of the United States. U.S. production of science and engineering articles has been effectively flat since 2000, so our share has gone from 28% at the turn of the century to 17% in 2018. But of course, quantity is not the whole story. There is also quality. Publications that receive more citations generally have more impact. Overall, the U.S. still has the largest margin of most highly cited publications, more than other countries by a very large margin. However, specialization and impact vary by country. The Western economies demonstrate more specialization and impact in astronomy and astrophysics, biological and biomedical sciences, geosciences, health sciences, psychology, and social sciences. Eastern economies, on the other hand, demonstrate more specialization and impact in chemistry, computer and information sciences, engineering, and material sciences. Research capacity is enhanced through connections with researchers around the world. Science and engineering research is increasingly internationally collaborative. Both in, that's true in both academic and business publications. EU countries, which in this graph include the UK, France, Germany, and Italy, show increased and high levels of collaboration. A major factor in the EU public, publications with collaborations is that EU funding practices actively encourage cross-EU collaboration. In 2018, 39% of U.S. articles were developed through international collaboration, and that's up from 19% in 2000. U.S. researchers collaborate frequently, and most frequently they collaborate with Chinese researchers. About 26% of U.S. internationally co-authored articles are with Chinese co-authors. The long-term trend of ever-increasing numbers of international students enrolling in U.S. institutions has recently changed. This figure shows the total number of international students enrolled in U.S. higher education institutions from 2012 through 2018, and this includes all areas of study, not just science and engineering. The blue bars represent undergraduates. The orange bars represent graduate students. And you can see that the numbers of students in both categories increased steadily through 2016. From 2016 to, to 2018, there has been a decline, particularly prominent between 2016 and 2017. And the decline continued but was smaller between, um, going forward to 2018. This decline has received a great deal of attention. Underlying the overall decline is a mixed picture that varies by student level, field of study, and country of origin. You can get a taste from this, of that from this figure. Despite the overall decline, the number of international graduate students increased slightly between 2017 and 2018. The U.S. remains the destination of choice for the largest number of internationally mobile students worldwide about 19% of them. Other popular destinations include the UK, Australia, France, Germany, and Russia. A majority of the science and engineering doctorate recipients with temporary visas between 2003 and 2017 stayed in the US five years after obtaining their degree. That means that the data that we are looking at is seriously lagging these students would have entered the U.S. about a decade before we actually see whether or not they have stayed in the United States. China and India, the two largest source countries for foreign recipients of U.S. s and &E doctorates, saw a decline in their respective stay rates. In the decades since 2003, 
The stay rate for Chinese students declined from 93% to 84% during that decade, and for Indian students, the stay rate declined from 90% to 85%. Note that subsequently, the stay rates have been fairly stable from 2013, uh, which is not shown in this view graph. These declines are notable particularly as three Asian countries, China, India, and South Korea, are the largest source countries and accounted for just over half of all international recipients of U.S. science and engineering doctoral degrees since 2000. And it's particularly important, as I mentioned earlier, to note that this is an especially lagging indicator. So it will take time for more recent developments in the global environment to be seen in these data. Now that we've seen some of the key data from Indicators 2000, we can discuss what this means for the U.S. science and engineering enterprise. So far, I've been talking strictly about the data and what the data say in and of themselves. That is the product of the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics which and Indicators 2020. The document, as I believe you know, is intended to be policy relevant but also policy neutral. The role of the National Science Board then is to layer the, some policy interpretation and implications on top of that policy neutral information. And that is uh, what I'm going to move into now. American preeminence in science and engineering has shaped our way of life for seven decades. Discoveries and new technologies will continue to open new frontiers. Science and engineering is truly a global enterprise now, more connected and more complex than ever, with opportunities everywhere and humanity's collective knowledge growing at an unimaginable rate. From indicators 2020, we see that the U.S. continues to lead in R&D expenditures, in high-impact publications, intellectual property and knowledge-intensive production, and the country remains a, the top destination for international science and engineering talent. Indicators 2020 also shows that the science and engineering world is rapidly expanding. Emerging economies, particularly China, and other countries and economies in the Asia-Pacific region are growing into major science and engineering players. These trends are expected to continue, in no small part because other countries increasingly recognize that investments in R&D translate into economic growth, job creation, and benefit to the country and the citizens. This dynamic, multipolar landscape is characterized by interdependence as well as competition. For the U.S. to continue to play a leading role, we cannot be complacent in the face of these challenges. We must adapt. The continued spread of science and engineering capacity across the globe is good for humanity. Science is not a zero-sum game. However, this also means that where once the U.S. was the uncontested leader in science and engineering, we are now playing a less dominant role in many areas. The U.S. is not likely to regain its share of dominance, but we are well positioned to stay at the forefront if we are proactive. So we need to ask, what are the data telling us? Where are we in danger of complacency? Where do we need to pro be proactive now to stay at the forefront of global science and engineering in the coming decades? It's worth noting that by the time we see problems clearly reflected in the data, it may be too late since all the data are lagging to at least some extent. Clearly, we need to think forward. In 2018, the National Science Board issued a statement noting that China would likely surpass the United States in total research and development expenditures by the end of 2018. The data from 2017 included in indicators 2020 show that there was a higher growth rate in the United States R&D than we previously projected. That is shown by the star. Let's now include that the preliminary data which was from on US R&D spending, which was published last week. When we include the most recent data in the Science Board's linear extrapolation, the crossover point, 
where China overtakes the U.S. in R&D expenditures shift forward. This updated National Science Board projection based on indicators and more recent data suggests that China may already have surpassed the U.S. in total R&D expenditures at some point in 2019. I'll talk a moment about the source of the uptick in U.S. R&D expenditures that has driven the change in the projected crossover point. But a key point to take away is this. We are not merely at the mercy of external forces. We can move the needle without, with our own policy choices that are within our control. In the U.S., we have shown time and again that we can rise to meet large challenges that, um, that come into our path, and we can meet those challenges and surpass them. We can lay out a vision for where we want to lead in the science and engineering landscape in this century and then implement policies and make investments that will put us on that path. U.S. annual spending in research and development grew modestly between 2000 and 2017, averaging 4.3% annually, driven mainly by the business sector, which is shown in gray in this um, chart. Business has been the largest funder of total research and development in the United States since the 1980s, and currently funds about 70% of the total R&D. The bulk of business R&D is on experimental development, and as you can see in the lower right-hand uh, chart, it's the growth in the business sector R&D, again the gray, that drove most of the larger than projected uptick in R&D expenditures in the last few years. We also see an increase in federal investment in fundamental research at, at a modest level in the upper right-hand uh, in the upper right-hand chart, and we are most grateful for Congress's wisdom in supporting that increase. But this upward trend is not enough to keep up with the accelerating pace of global research. Overall, the federal government's share of R&D funding has declined since 2000, and, it, um, and this is notable because the federal support is a crucial source of support for the nation's fundamental research enterprise. In 2017, the federal government funded 38%, that's about $76 billion of U.S. fundamental research, while the business sector accounted for 43%, or $85 billion. It's important to note that business uh, investment in fundamental research is predominantly directed towards areas where business sees that it may see a reasonably near-term benefit in the bottom line. And so it does not cover research, uh, fundamental research across the broad spectrum of areas that are supported by the federal government. Amid the dramatic growth in China's R&D investment that we saw in the previous slide, I'd like to reiterate that the good news is that the U.S. maintains a significant advantage in fundamental research. Federal support of fundamental research drives future discovery and innovation, and in fact, federal investment in fundamental research has laid the groundwork that positions the United States to compete in the currently identified industries of the future. And only the federal government can make strategic, long-term commitment to creating new knowledge that cannot be anticipated before the fact to lead to new or improved technologies, goods, or services. And support, and also the federal government is the only entity that can support long-term risks that are difficult for the private sector to undertake. It is this investment that actually lays the foundation for industries of the future and what might be beyond quantum information systems and um, artificial intelligence and other areas of current emphasis for uh, moving into experimental development. Demand for people with science and engineering keeps growing. Since 1960, the United States science and engineering workforce has grown faster than the overall workforce. By 2026, science and engineering jobs are projected to grow by 13% with 7% growth in the overall workshop, workforce. For decades, the United States has relied on foreign-born talent to help meet its science and engineering job needs. The share of the foreign-born S&E workers 
has increased significantly in the past 25 years. In most science and engineering occupations, the higher the degree level, the greater the proportion of the workforce that is foreign born. In critical fields, such as computer science, mathematics, and engineering, nearly 60% of PhD holders in the U U.S. workforce are foreign born. Turning to students, the total number of first-year graduate students, both domestic and foreign, enrolled in graduate science and engineering programs in the U.S. decreased by 1.5% between 2005 and 2017. Over this period, foreign students enrolled in graduate study in natural science or engineering decreased by 7%, while numbers of domestic students increased by 10%. It is interesting to note that in 2015, for the first time, foreign students comprised a majority, 51% of all first-year graduate students in natural science and engineering. However, the number of first-year foreign graduate students dropped back to 46% in 2017. The decrease in first-year foreign student enrollment in science and engineering fields combined with apparent declines in stay rate for the two largest source countries, China and India, indicates that we can no longer take it for granted that the U.S. will be the destination of choice for globally mobile talent. More countries than ever are competing for the best minds, and these individuals have choices today that did not exist as recently as 20 years ago in selecting a place to study, perform research, and innovate. Amid the global bidding war for talent, we need to avoid complacency and strive to remain a beacon by affirming our values and investing in our domestic R&D ecosystem and research infrastructure. We must preserve our fundamental openness to international STEM talent. While we take steps to ensure that we remain a top destination for foreign talent, America must also ensure that domestic STEM talent is nurtured at every educational level, among all demographic groups, and in every region of the country. What do the indicators tell us about this? The racial and ethnic composition of science and engineering degree recipients has changed over time, reflecting population changes and increasing rates of higher education attainment by members of underrepresented minority groups. The gap in educational attainment by members of uh, the, the gap in educational attainment has narrowed across racial and ethnic groups, but it remains as shown in this figure. The gaps in many cases reflect lower rates of high school completion, college enrollment, and degree attainment. It's also interesting to note variations in degree levels attained by race and ethnicity. Hispanics, shown by the dark blue bar, are overrepresented at associate's degree level, underrepresented uh, under at bachelor's, master's, and PhD levels. Blacks, shown by the orange bar, are underrepresented at all degree levels, while Asians, at the yellow bar, are overrepresented. However, since 2000, the share of science and engineering bachelor's degrees awarded annually to Hispanic students has nearly doubled, while the share awarded to black students has remained flat. While the number of science and engineering bachelor's degrees earned by white students has increased be by two th between 2000 and 2017, their overall share declined as the size of the workforce has grown. The science and engineering enterprise in the United States ideally should reflect our population in race, ethnicity, and gender. While there has been some progress, it's clear that we have a long way to go to reach this goal. We believe that much more urgent focus on nurturing our domestic talent must be a priority for our nation. Domestically, the, talent, the data show increased numbers of women and underrepresented minorities, Blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians and Alaska Natives in the science and engineering workforce. For, no, for example, the number of women in SNE jobs who hold a bachelor's degree in science and engineering doubled since 1995. These data are on the left side of this chart. Since 1993, the numbers of underrepresented minorities with their highest degree in science and engineering collectively increased nearly fourfold. That's the right side of, the of this slide. Note the changes in the numbers of women 
and underrepresented minorities vary significantly among fields. These increases were outpaced by the rapid growth of science and engineering jobs so that women and minorities remain underrepresented relative to their proportions to the U.S. population. And while the past decade has seen increases in the number of underrepresented minorities in the s and enterprise, this pace of improvement is not keeping up with changes in the racial and ethnic, ethnic demographics in the broader population. Just as one example, on the left chart showing women in computer sciences and mathematics, one sees with the bars a very dramatic growth in the number of women um, in these fields, but the percent share in the workforce has actually dropped over the period shown in the chart. While women's representation in science and engineering is improving, significant underrepresentation remains in computer sciences, math, and engineering. These are fields that already represent 75% of STEM occupations and are expected to grow faster than other fields. They are also fields where we are most reliant on foreign talent. For the U.S. science and engineering enterprise truly to flourish, it must reflect the same diversity as our nation. United States Science and, uh, science and mathematics assessment are a measure of how the country is doing in preparing our population for current and future job demands. Based on test scores, U.S. science and mathematics education at the elementary and secondary level is mediocre relative to other nations. We see this in the TIMS data, which are shown in the slide, and also in the most recent PISA results, which you may have heard about late last year. In, the, in those studies, the U.S. ranked 18th in science and 37th in math. U.S. student performance has been quite stable over time with no significant improvement or decline. The data from domestic tests also show that U.S. students per, student performance in math and science has been stagnant over the last decade. This is one of the most clear indicators of U.S. complacency that we see in the data. Domestically, U.S. STEM education from kindergarten to graduate school must welcome and serve students of all backgrounds and in all areas. The status quo where students of color or from low socioeconomic backgrounds consistently fall behind in math and science will not suffice. Just as illiteracy is not considered a virtue, it can no longer be acceptable to be bad at math. We must redouble our efforts to ensure that Americans at all education levels are STEM capable. While this is not a new problem, the need for STEM skills across a wider range of jobs than ever before find, uh, makes finding ways to move the needle on math and science complacency more important, competency, excuse me, more important than ever. All of these factors point to troubled waters for our economy and our citizens going forward unless we take steps now. Now I would like to turn the floor back over to the National Science Board Chair, Diane Suvain. Thank you, Julia. 59 years ago, President Kennedy set America on a path to the moon. Today we find ourselves again in an hour of challenge and change. As we've just seen in the data from Indicators 2020, there's more competition, collaboration, and knowledge production across the global s and environment than ever before. Other countries are rapidly adopting the blueprint that is driven U.S. science and engineering leadership, economic prosperity, and security for the past seven decades. It's important to remember healthy competition in science and engineering provides benefits to all of humanity. New knowledge benefits everyone. The global competition for talent and ideas is a challenge that needs to and will spur us to up our game. There's no denying that the U.S. science and engineering enterprise faces headwinds, that is unaddressed risk the science and engineering global leadership that our nation has enjoyed since 1950. 
Barring faster adaptation across our s and ecosystem, we risk falling behind other as other countries attract globally mobile students, globally mobile scientists and engineers, and as we continue to make slow progress in fully developing our domestic talent. All of these factors could lead to critical technologies being developed elsewhere with potentially devastating impacts on the U.S. economy and security. Why is U.S. preeminence in science and technology so important? From quantum computing to artificial intelligence to the data revolution, scientific advancements come with both opportunities and risks. To mitigate those risks in an increasingly competitive world, we must stay at the forefront of science and cutting edge research. Public funding of fundamental research is a sustained commitment over a long time horizon and a competitive advantage for the United States. The past has shown that investment in such research now will give us the keys to meeting the security, health, and economic challenges of the future. Challenges that we know will arise, but whose nature we cannot predict. As other countries invest in their science and engineering enterprises, ours is transitioning towards a smaller share of global discovery and innovation. To remain competitive, we must adapt more quickly through partnerships and collaborations, reaffirm our values, give Americans the STEM knowledge and skills they need to thrive, and ensure that we have the infrastructure and resources to provide a home for the world's best talent and ideas. So what should we do as we look toward the future? We believe that our nation should be bold. We should be fearless. Let's not really merely react to anxieties from global competition, concerns about security threats, or angst about constrained budgets. Instead, let's ask how can we lead the next era of science and engineering, remembering the can-do attitude that defines America. We must recommit to the partnerships among governments universities in the private sector that have driven our success. Let's unleash our strengths, a spirit of exploration, of wonder, of discovery, coupled with a willingness to take risks and an emphasis on freedom and individual creativity to ensure America's continued preeminence in research and innovation in the 21st century. Because the best way to lead the future is to invent it. Thank you all for your attention, and we look forward to your questions.